Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jian Min Chen. Uh, this work was done by my PhD student. Unfortunately, he couldn't come here to present his work uh, because of visa problems. So I'm going to present it how we can combine protein sequence and structures with protein language models and equivariant graph neural networks to improve protein function prediction. As we know, protein function prediction is very important because we still don't know the function of most, pro uh, most proteins. Here, you can see um, the number of the proteins in the uniprot has increased exponentially. However, the number of proteins with many annotations only increase uh, slowly. Right now, we have about 250 million proteins in the Unipro, but we only have about 0.57 million proteins that have many annotations. The ratio between the two is 0.23%. Uh, so there's a huge sequence and a function uh, gap. However, experimental techniques cannot be applied to solve all these protein functions because they are too expensive and uh, time consuming. So the computational prediction is a key to address this problem. A lot of protein function prediction methods have been developed. Most methods use the sequence information as input. They use the protein sequence or the profile constructed for multiple sequence alignments for the homology search methods or machine learning methods to protein function prediction that are described by the goal terms. Uh, however, they haven't uh, leveraged their protein language models to generate the features for proteins effectively when we when we done this work. There are also some methods use protein structure as input to predict protein function, but they, those methods were trained on the models generated by old traditional protein structure prediction methods without leveraging the uh, large scale unfold generated protein structure models. And when they use protein structure as input, they tend to convert protein structure into a count map as input to predict function without directly leveraging the tertiary structure information of the protein to uh, improve protein function prediction. There are also some methods use protein-protein interaction and other protein context information uh, to uh, predict protein function. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on how to combine sequence and structure information to improve protein function prediction and overcoming these three major limitations of existing methods. The first thing we want to do is we're going to use uh, pre-trained protein language models to extra the features for the proteins as input. So as we have seen many protein language models in this conference, the basic idea is protein language model is a transformer based on the self-attention mechanism. It's trained, use the self-supervised learning to predict the, uh, for input is a sequence. It just predicts randomly masked amino acids. They trained on millions of protein sequences without using any labels. So even, but they are not targeting any particular protein problem. However, once, once it's trained, it learns the dependence between amino acids and the interaction between amino acids goes through the evolution process. And this information, this model, can be used to extract the features for each amino acid in your protein sequence uh, and for the downstream prediction task, such as protein function prediction in this work. Another thing we want to do is we want to directly use protein tertiary structure as input. However, using tertiary structure prediction is very challenging because the protein structure is 3D object. You rotate it and, rot and translate it. X, Y, Z according to the change. But a feature, but a, your essential properties like the protein function do not change. So we need a models that can capture features with three, that are independent of the rotation and translation of the 3D object. That's called the equivariant and the invariant neural networks. Now I'd like to use a face recognition example to illustrate this two concept. So Suppose we give an input of uh, something in the face, face recognition. We have a series of face in the different orientation. So for each face, if no matter how you orientate your face, the same face, you still get the same features. That means your model is invariant to the input, rotation and translation. Another case is you, if you rotate your face, you see the features also rotate in the hidden space. This is called an equivariant. It's also sufficient to capture the essential features for prediction. And fortunately, we have such model called a uh, uh, equivalent graph neural network uh, EGN for 3D object. The input is a graph. Each node represents a, let's say, amino acid. Edge represents the relationship between amino acids. And uh, also, each node was, also has some features, input features, embeddings, and also XYZ coordinates. Now, we have a model we want to generate the new features, update the features. So we can do it in two ways. One is here's my input. 
I can first translate and rotate my input. I get a new input, then I apply a neural network model to generate my features, update features. That's one way. Another way is I can use the same neural network to generate feature from original input. Then I rotate and translate the hidden features in the hidden space. If I get exactly the same thing, that means this network is equivalent to the rotation and the translation of the 3D object. That's what we want. And how does it achieve this? So here is a, is a network. I want to update the feature of a node. The first thing I want to do is I capture, I want to generate the message sent from its labeling nodes to this node using this function based on the input features of node i and j and the distance between them and also the edge information. Because the distance between two nodes is independent of the rotation and translation. So the message is sending from the labor j to the load i is equivalent, invariant. Then we can use this message from all the labors together with the current coordinates of this uh, node to generate a new feature or a new position for this node. Moreover, we can sum all the message from the labor nodes for this node i together and then use this message and its own features to generate new features. Because this message is equivalent to the rotation translation, so the whole update process is equivalent to the rotation and translation of the pseudo object. Now, given this tool for us, now given the protein structure, we're going to generate the graph to represent this protein structure using the K Lewis labor approach. Basically, for each residue represented as a load, we find it's a laboring, this uh, labor, uh, K, K Lewis labors and connect them and use edges. And the K is equal to the cubic root of the length of the protein M. So we get a graph. We get a nose. Now we need to get the features for this nose. We use uh, we use uh, uh, a pre-trained language models called the evolutionary scale models (ESMN) to give a protein sequence as input. We generate the features. Basically, we just actually the last layer, thirty third hidden layer of this model to generate the hidden features for each amino acid. We also can average these uh, features for all the residues during the embedding for the entire protein uh, sequence as input. So those are the features. Then we use these features as a load of features in my graph. So here is the overall pipeline of this method. Here are protein sequence. We use the uh, transform ESM model to generate the features for each node as a node of features for this graph or for the for the all the amino acids. We also use alpha fold to produce the tertiary structure of this protein. From tertiary structure, we construct a k uh, labor graph. Then we combine features with graph. We get an input structure for this protein. Then we use four EGM blocks to generate the hidden features. So each EGM block has four EGM layers I just described. Uh, the graph, well, the first hidden layer, EGM block generates some hidden features. Use as input for the second EGM block, generate more features for the uh, EGM block four. And all the features from these three blocks are also combined together as the features. Moreover, we also generate the protein level uh, hidden features for, for this protein. Use another EGM block to generate some hidden features. And all of them are combined together as the features for the two fully connected block to generate the final layers of the hidden features. Each fully connected network has uh, one linear, fully connected linear layer, uh, ReLU function, and the batch normalizations. And finally, with all those hidden features, we use sigmoid function to predict the probability of each go term for this protein. So it's a multi-label labeling problem. OK, in order to train such a model, we actually create a data set from Uniprod we just heard. So we download um, the proteins from Uniprod with many annotation released by February 20, uh, 23rd, 2022. So we got about 566,000 proteins. Then we retrieve their tertiary structures from AfroDB. Then we select only proteins that are with a strong function, uh, annota strong, uh, function annotation with strong evidence. Then we get a set of the proteins with the function as labels. Because we're going to use Kava 3 test data set uh, as an uh, independent test data set. So we actually remove the proteins in my training data set that has more than 50% of sequence identity with the test data set. Finally, I get a bunch of proteins. However, these proteins can be similar to each other. So we use, uh, we try to class them into groups based on the sequence uh, identity. 
So we use three different sequences underneath threshold, 30%, 50%, 90%. So we get a number of the clusters, thousands of clusters. Um, we select randomly select 5,000 as a validation data set and the remaining clusters as my uh, training data. So here are the statistics uh, of these uh, data set for the three uh, gene ontology function category, uh, molecular uh, function, uh, cellular component, and uh, biological process. The number of proteins in each category is, is ranging from 35,000 um, to 50,000. Number of goal terms, number of classes we only predict ranging from 600 to 3,700. And also for, at each uh, clustering identity threshold uh, for, for a point of three identity, we get about 14,000 to 20,000 clusters. For point of five, we get more, and point nine, point of nine, we get even more. And we choose the point of five threshold uh, to get the clusters and generate the training data and the validation data set. And we also have the two test data sets to independently test our models. So the first data set is already uh, the CARP3 test data set. It has about 3,000 uh, proteins with less than 50% of sequence identity with my training data. And also a new test data set we generated after the training data uh, were created. So we collect the proteins after that released in the, in the Uniprot, and we get a, a thousand of proteins. Uh, here's the statistics uh, of the sequence sequence identity between these new test data proteins and the training protein and the validation protein. So here's a distribution histogram of the sequence identity in the three function category. You can see very clearly most proteins have very low sequence identity with uh, uh, training data set, less than 10% of sequence identity. But indeed, there are some proteins that have an even higher uh, sequence identity with the training data. So here are the metrics we use to evaluate our methods. We use the precision of the goal term predictions, uh, recall, and what's most importantly, we use the F measure is a geometric mean considering both equation, uh, both precision and recall. Because F measure depends on the threshold of your uh, making the goal prediction uh, decision, right? So we choose this threshold that gives the maximum F measure for each method to assess its performance. We also use the area under the precision recall curve to assess the overall performance of the, all the different methods. Here are the results of the methods we compared. Um, so the first method is like U method. So basically we just use the frequency of goal terms to make a prediction. The second one is a diamond score. It's a widely used sequence homology search methods that uh, has very good uh, homology based prediction accuracy. And also for uh, deep learning methods, deep goal use a convolution neural network and with the sequence as input, deep goal CN uh, use multiple convolution neural networks and a tail use transformer as input with sequence. And our method, transform use both language model, EG network, and a sequence and a structure all together to make a prediction. So you can see based on these metrics, our method actually performed best in most situation and it performed second best in the in biological process in terms of FMAX and the second best in the cellular component in terms of the uh, area under the precision recall curve. So, uh, and very interestingly, we can see the top uh, machine learning methods actually perform better than the best homology-based method. So that means machine learning outperform homology-based methods on this data set. We will, here are the results on the uh, new test data set. The green ones represent the methods I just described, the single approach methods. Just use a single method to make a prediction. Uh, I add a new method called a deep fry here. So you can see among these single method, uh, transplant still work best on this test data set in most situations except one. We also try to say if we combine the two kinds of methods, we combine homology based method diamond score with each machine learning method, uh, just simply average the output probability, then we make the meta prediction. So we call those meta methods, those blue ones. And we can see uh, the, this transplant plus is a combination of our method with the diamond score. Uh, tail, tail plus is a, uh, is a combination of the tail with the uh, diamond score. You can see those methods actually perform better than, slightly better than the single, best single methods. That means combine homology and machine learning works better than, slightly better than the using machine learning alone. And among these meta methods, all methods still work best in most situations. Here is a precision recall of these methods in the uh, molecular function category. You can see this outermost curve is a transform plus our methods, meta method. 
Uh, second one is tail plus, and the third one is a trans uh, is a transfer. Here, these curve, these orange short averaging curve, correspond to the precision we call the diamond score. You can see its curve is much narrow, right? It's just a small range of the precision recall. But all methods actually you can give you a full, almost full range of the precision recall for users to choose. So that's another advantage in addition just to be higher accuracy. Um, so here are the results for the another three function category, cellular component and the biological process. We see the similar phenomena as we see in the volocate function. Finally, we also try to compare uh, how these muscles work on the hard proteins that have very little sequence identity, less than 10% of sequence identity, or 30% of sequence identity with the training or the validation deficit. Here are the results uh, of these methods. We can see transfer and best, actually in almost all the situation except the one. Um, it performs better in the cellular component and molecular function than in the biological process. Um, the reason is that you want to, uh, the sequence and structure information is very, are very good for the uh, 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 molecular function and cellular component prediction, but it's not sufficient for the biological process prediction. So it's a little bit lower accuracy on biological process. For biological process, process prediction, we need a protein interaction and the context information. We also compare these performance on the hard proteins with all the test proteins in the new test data set. Actually, they have similar performance. That means this machine learning model can generalize very well from the data to the new proteins they've never seen before. But however, you can see diamond, diamond actually performs much worse on these very hard proteins. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation with a few observations. Evolution features generated by the uh, language models are very important for the protein function prediction. Protein structures can help function prediction. And the 3D equivalent deep learning models, graph neural networks, transformers, are very useful for dealing with the 3D objects like uh, protein structure. And the deep learning performs better than homology-based methods. And combine homology and the deep learning, you're going to get even better results. But we need to find better methods. With that, I'd like to thank my student, Fu Yinpang, who did the work and uh, my collaborator and also funding agency. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, what motivates you to create separate models for each function category and if you tried to put them all in one model? I think that's a great question. The reason we do that is everybody, everybody did that in the literature. Uh, try, try one model for each function category. But I think the correlation between the three categories of function terms is better to actually train one model for all goal terms, no matter which function you should come from. We, I already have this idea. I already submitted a proposal on that. I got funded, actually. <laughs> that's one idea people like, but we haven't got results yet. That's something we're working on. So you guys are welcome to try to train a model on all go terms to see whether or not there has some correlation, multitasking, whether or not one task will help you get results better in another task. So that's a fantastic question. And my question, how do you guarantee predicted structure is correct despite alpha faults? Do you mean input sequence is a short type with potential that they analyze it? Is it your framework is beautiful? Because alpha fold performs not good in short That's a great question. So we cannot guarantee alpha fold can give you a very good prediction for every protein structure, protein sequence. However, it generally can give you a good predictions for most proteins. So that a signal is sufficient for you to train a model. So your model will be able to robust. Deep learning is very robust against noise. Sometimes you have a little error in the input. Deep learning will ignore that at noise and they try to use the signals provided. So so yeah, you can use it. You don't need to wait for the perfect uh, protein structures available for you to make a function between. That's number one. Number two is actually we did some tests. We compare the performance on using two structures as input and using upvote based structure as input. You basically get a similar results. So you, have to, you should be uh, feel confident to use the upvote predicted structure as input. 